Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be joining us from. My name is Devin Morgan, director of youth baseball at Driveline, founder of the Driveline Academy, and this is the Driveline Academy podcast, the most dangerous youth bo- youth baseball podcast in the world. That's what they say. Uh, joined as per usual by my brother, my partner, Driveline Academy assistant director Jeremy Tectiel. Um, and we are recording to you live uh, on the shores of sunny Kent, Washington. Uh, the day it's after- extremely sunny. Yeah, yeah. extremely sunny. Uh, the day after Mother's Day. Um, and like, man, uh, couldn't do it without the moms. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and provide this public service for any other dads that are in the same boat that I was in, where uh, after spending seven and a half ish hours baking in the sun yesterday uh, on the field, um, all my um, wife wanted to do was get some takeout from her local uh, favorite Mexican place and sit on the couch and rock, watch some 30 Rock. Um, and that's what we did. Uh, but because of that, I did not, I guess, either make um, or from a perspective of extreme ownership, I did not take the time to create like an overly emotional, overwrought Instagram tribute to my wife. Um, so I'll do this for the sake of all the dads out there in the same boat. Um, okay, ready? Three, two, one. We love you. Um Man, it's so necessary. I, I think, you know, whether you're a mom who uh, is bringing 50 pounds of hydration to the field for your kid and the rest of the kids in your kid's dugout, or even the kids on the other dugout, 50 pounds of snacks, or you're a mom who's like actively filling out a lineup card, giving your kids some extra BP, hitting them some grounders and, and teaching them about the game. Um, man, we just, we literally couldn't do without you. Nope. Um, and that, and that even doesn't kind of go to talk about the moms who suffer through coaches who uh, sometimes need a sounding board as we like agonize over roster construction uh, lineup choices about like 9, 10, 11, and 12 year old children. Um, And those moms would very much be within their right to be like, hey, dummy, it's not that important. Relax. You are not an MLB manager. Yeah. But um, but they still listen and, and provide uh, balance. And, and man, you know, my, my wife, um, I know I've had conversations with my kids where we've been in the car and like I'm hyper fixated on trying to communicate some sort of like developmental idea. Right. I want to I want to make sure that they get it, yeah. you know, and, um, and and she's very much the one that's there to be like, hey, we just love to watch you play. You know, you, you had a great effort out there um, and kids need that balance, especially in youth baseball. And in so much as that is balance, it can be pre provided by either men or women, um, whether you're a mom, a grandma, an aunt, a sister, a partner, and you're serving that function. We need it and we appreciate the heck out of you. Um, in the words of Tupac Amaro Shakur, you are appreciated. Um, so, yeah. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Um, personal note, uh, your boy's been dealing with some health problems, which is just the best part about getting old. Like, it's just it's just absolutely delightful, right? So, uh, so let me paint this picture. Uh, I have to go get some blood work done. Simultaneous to this, I'm like, I got to lose a couple pounds, right? Uh, motorcycle gear is feeling a little tighter than it used to. <laughs> So, you know, I, I got I to gotta lose a couple. Leather, right? not super flexible. No, yeah. no, it's not. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm probably not going to get down to the weight that I actually still list on my driver's license. But, <laughs> but like, I, I can lose a couple and still be fine, right? <laughs> so, uh, so my wonderful wife um, knows that I have a snack issue. Uh, I, I, like, I got called snacks by my uh, friend group at one point in time. Uh, I am like the cookie monster. Like I will crush a box of cookies, crackers, chips. Like I, I will house it. And my darling wife um, is trying to enable me to make uh, better choices. So we're in Costco and she sees like this, uh, these limited edition lime and chili almonds. Uh, we buy them, we take them home. They're delicious. And my wife, because she's a gamer, goes back to Costco and gets two more bags to make sure that I have like a good supply of healthy snacks that I can use over the course of this summer while I'm going to be watching a lot of baseball. Summer, three bags for the whole summer. Well, sure. And yeah. So I got a yeah. ration, yeah. right? Right. Um, so this all happens like within the last like week and a half, two weeks or whatever. And, and then I have to go get my blood work done, but I have to wait for the results to come back. We've had a lot of games in this last like week, week and a half. 
um, which we'll talk about in a bit. And I'm sitting in the stands just like crushing these almonds, right? Get my blood work back. Guess what I'm allergic to? Almonds! Sorry, did I bury... Did I... Uh... So, so I probably have four pounds of almonds <laughs> in my house now that I can't eat. Oh, uh, it's uh, it's just it's great. Getting old is absolutely the best, um, and uh, yeah, I just love all these things that we find. So yeah, we've had uh, a lot of games in the last week. I can't uh, imagine how much I would eat during games if I. Oh, the stress eating is yeah, real. Yeah, it's super. If real. I'm not like, if I wasn't standing in the third base coaching box, yeah. Oh, I'd be housing so much food. Yeah. 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 I mean, for, for probably every year that I coached, when we were on fields that were dirt and not turf, I would have a, a thing of seeds on me. Yeah. And we'd finish games and like, you know, I'd go straight to the field after work, uh, pregame, get everybody ready, game and finish. And we'd get done and like, I wouldn't be really hungry. Well, it's, yeah, dummy, because you ate like you an- You just a bag of seeds. Yeah, a whole bag of seeds. Yeah. Easy. The pickle flavored ones? Oh, Come God. On, oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, so after lamenting, uh, nay, complaining about our weather in the last couple weeks. Uh, we've done the other thing. Well, now the outside is a microwave, um, and we still have, complaining. We're still, still complaining. complaining, of course. But now the complaining about the other thing, where you, you can't. We can't just have like mid seventies, like a nice, 70s, like mid to 70s. low seventies, like just yeah, yeah. Um, and we had uh, so we've had what five games over six days yeah. or something like that. Um, in dealing with some heat and what I wanted to talk about today is actually put you on the spot to kind of talk coach, take the, the podcast co-host hat off, put on the team coach and like really talk about some of the nitty gritty ways that we um, design run and manage our teams. Because I think that's just another layer to it that, um, you know, it's like I was thinking about the the new youth training book, as I always am, because that's like basically my only project right now uh, that I'm actively working on, um, in addition to some other cool stuff that we have about prototype bats, and we got some cool stuff happening. Um, but I think about the book where it's just like, every time I kind of reread, reread through the manuscript, I'm like, what are we not telling people in here if this thing is supposed to be like the, the single source yeah. of how we want to do it? Um, so part of me selfishly is going to record this podcast with that intention that I'm going to steal every single good idea you have, <laughs> or I'm just going to transcribe it. Um, but I think in all seriousness for other coaches, I think, you know, we talk about this need for like a holistic approach where we're focused on player development, but that doesn't exist just within the walls of the facility that carries on towards the way that we conduct ourselves, construct our teams and express that same ideal when we're on a field. Um, so I thought it would be good to kind of go through that. But the first thing that came to mind is roster management when you're dealing with five games over the course of six days, which which is a lot, but that's a tournament weekend a lot of times. Yeah. Which, which is the crazy thing about it because, you know, when I saw our kids, you know, at the end of the last game that we played yesterday, I think they were just tired. Oh, they like, were so gassed. Yeah. Like, like, understandably gassed, and that's okay. Um, and, and I think we can talk about some of the ways that you saw that and then uh, made managerial decisions in consideration, which was wonderfully handled. But the reality is, is that like for so many of these teams, they're going through that every other weekend or every single weekend, and they're dealing with that same stuff. So, like, man, um, you can find a lot of things in baseball and youth baseball to, like, point the finger at. Like, this is the reason why kids get hurt. This is the reason why all these bad outcomes happen. At the end of the day, you cannot convince me that there is anything more significant in that equation than too many games and not enough time. Yep. That that's just that's just it. And I'm sure I've made this point twenty times here, and I will continue to make it because it's not changing. Um, and like, man, I saw our kids, um, you know, looking looking pretty fatigued in that last game that we played yesterday. And then consider what that looks like for kids in Arizona, Texas, California, Florida, who like are getting beat down by that climate all the time. And I'm sure that there is like a certain point of natural acclimation. Oh, like you, you acclimate to it, whatever. Right. But the workload is the issue. The, the climate can be an accelerating or a decelerating factor, but the workload is the real issue. Um, so I kind of just made a list of like some stuff that I think we could kind of talk about in terms of team management and how we express this idea of, progressive 
development focused youth baseball in a team setting top top first thing is like team construction like yeah. how you know what what are we looking for and how do we start to build teams so uh when you kind of look took over the reins we're looking at like hey you know we had probably two teams worth of kids coming back is the first thing that you're kind of looking to start with is just like the high leverage positions in terms of pitching catching and kind of going from there What's the what's the first thing to kind of start breaking them down into a team? Yeah, that's the first thing I did this year was making sure every team that we had uh, and like it's tough um, because we did have a decent amount of turnover with our athlete, athletes last year. Yeah, um, and our tryout process uh, intentionally, every trial process, but ours specifically and intentionally uh, is just not going to give you that much information about a kid, right? So like if they list on their tryout form, I'm a catcher or I'm a pitcher, that's kind of what I have to go based off of, right? Like, I'm assuming if you put pitcher-catcher on there, you have played both of those positions before. Yeah. I'm not asking, like, pitcher-catcher 1 to 10. Like, oh, are you a 7? Right. Are you a 4? Like, uh, you know, and what would give me the, um, the number of innings you've, you've played at each position yeah. or whatever. Like, where are you willing to play? Which, yeah. in most situations, is enough, right? Um, and I made sure that every team that we had, we have 16 teams, every team that we have has more has two catchers at minimum. Yeah. Two kids that have listed catcher or like I know can play catcher because we've had them before. Um, and then pitching is one of those things that like we train every kid as a pitcher. Right. right? Like once you get to I, – I don't think we have any – I mean we don't have any uh, – we don't really have anybody that's on 14U that won't pitch. There's a couple kids that are like, yeah. you are the last pitcher I'm going to bring in because you don't love to do it. But like, we have every single kid in 14U getting on a mound. Yeah. 15U, almost every single kid gets on a mound. There's very few kids that we have that like don't get some sort of training as a pitcher, which as I talked to my kids about yesterday, uh, is mostly because uh, arm care helps you make better throws as a yep. outfielder infielder catcher wherever you're going to play even if you're not a pitcher uh, it's important to throw it harder um weird weird but we have you know everybody on our on every team that we have uh has thrown bullpens and, and has been trained as a pitcher uh the way they've gone about that uh and then they've also gotten defensive work in infield outfields uh catcher first base um they're not always going to play all those positions, especially as you get older. Uh, and we've got, you know, one of our 14 new teams has like three lefties. So it's like, all right, well, nobody else can really play first because these guys have to. Yeah. Um, or, you know, because there's not enough outfield spots or whatever. But that's definitely the first thing I look for yeah. is like making sure everyone's got enough catching and pitching. Because uh, the tournament weekends are, are like at the forefront of my mind, right? Like we switched to a league this year uh, for the bulk of our games. But we're still, every team is still doing... Some tournaments. Three to four tournaments, uh, whether it's like packed in over the summer or like spread out for our 13s and 14s over, you know, one, one a month or whatever. Uh, and like those are the times where like you need the pitching the most um, because you could play five games. Um, good luck playing five games if you don't have at minimum 10 kids you're comfortable throwing on a mound um, and, or and, they're comfortable on a mound. Right. And, and I think the big question is, is it like, again, how many – how many coaches are constructing teams that way? Uh, very few, because what you see in tournaments is guys pit, coming back on back-to-back -back days, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, whether it's we're going to limit you on Saturday uh, and like we can get into what I did this week or whatever, yeah. but like we can limit you on Saturday uh, and then we're going to bring you back on Sunday. So like I'm going to start you. Uh, if we start to put up some runs and get a lead, I'm yanking you immediately and then uh, keeping you under 20 pitches so I can bring you back for Sunday. Yeah. And most of those teams have like – four five pitchers yeah. and that they, they pitch Saturday and then they pitch again on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, and then like, look, you can, you can maybe get away with that for a weekend. You're doing that all summer. These kids are going to fry. Like you're going to fry arms and like, I'm not going to name any names, but the team we played yesterday has five different kids. I believe that are injured on that roster right now. Uh, and it is may the middle of may. Um, and a lot of arm injuries in the middle of may is like, you know, puts you in a rough spot. So to, to walk it all the way back, this initial question about like team construction. So we're, we're starting with kind of X amount of kids that we feel reasonably confident can get on the bump. Yeah. But then we're also training all of them to get on the bump. Right. 
which is one of those things that, you know, when, when I see this conversation about um, rule changes, broad rule changes, we're talking about like the entire ecosystem of a large national tournament organization or anything of that kind, right? The, uh, the thing that a lot of people will say is just like, well, the coaches just need to train more kids to pitch. Yeah, I get that. The problem is, is that the incentive structure of the environment that those kids are participating in, nay, the ecosystem. Um, I had to get it in. We still have more in our shirts on the pod. God darn it. Sorry, yeah. Jerry. My bad, Jerry. Um, the incentive structure of that environment does not compel you to give those kids the probably, let's see, the six through 10 number of kids that could pitch opportunities to pitch. And that's not uh exclusive to pitching right yep no a hundred percent you take that same idea and basically think about it the way that it affects every other position and each way that you can construct a batting order the whole deal the whole deal um what we do on the other hand is you know try to make a relatively good decision about making sure we're stocked for some of those positions at the beginning but then literally go out of our way and put time into building them yep Um, which is an interesting thing, right? Because if you take, you know, if you just like, okay, I have a staff of five at 14, U, 13, 12 or whatever. Um, at a certain point, it makes sense to me that some of those teams and those coaches start drilling down on like really, really minor things for those pitchers, right? Um, very small technique things. Uh, like think about it. If you've got, I've got 10 pitchers on my roster team we're playing as five. If like let's just say the practice time is equal, he his five pitchers are going to get double the double the amount of attention, instruction, practice as mine will because like I've got ten different guys throwing off a mound. So right. like I because we have to work all of them in because we right. have to keep the the workload level consistent once consistent. we establish it. Right. Yeah, and like that's you know uh, we've got especially at uh, younger ages, um, kids who are not as used to pitching Mm -hmm. that we're throwing through uh, things. And like, yes, um, I do understand the fact that uh, we're spending time on them uh, and maybe less, that means we're spending less time with some of the better pitchers on that roster of getting them from one to two. And we're spending time at the bottom of the roster, getting them to zero to one. Sure. uh, In a lot of cases. And, and, it can feel if you are one of the ones who was already at a one, it can feel like you're getting less instruction uh, or like less attention because, hey, if you went to another team and you're their, one of their top five pitchers, you're the only one that's throwing bullpens at practice. Uh, you get all of the bullpens at practice, whereas these other kids don't. Um, yeah. So sure. I, I understand that, but like it's a give and take. And, um, you know, you're not going to solve command problems that way no although um you know there's some rising tide raises all ships to the idea that like this commitment to arm care and this commitment to always being intentional about command and uh periodizing and maintaining workload you know i'll 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 hedge my bets a little bit Mm -hmm. and say that like 14 you on down um i think to me that that is the path because the best pitchers are generally going to be your best throwers. And I would rather, and, and again, if you're if you're presenting me the options where I could have a team that has 10 kids who are functional and are good pitchers but are not hyper-optimized to pitch, I would rather have that and have, and to be real clear, have my kid be one of those 10 rather than only have five. Yeah. Because, yeah, at five pitchers at 14 you down, Sure, maybe we get a chance to really hyper optimize on some minutia of the task. But you're also putting that kid in a box where they're more likely to be overworked because you didn't grow enough of the crop that you need. Right. And the, that kid is not for nothing going to put way more pressure on himself uh, because if you only have five pitchers, you got to go deep. You got to go deep. Yep. And like now you're. Uh, you are asking a lot of that kid. And if that kid struggles one day, he may tank the entire tournament for your whole team. Yeah. Yeah. And, and take that very hard and put that on himself. Whereas, you know, I'm in the position where I can yank guys pretty quick. Cause I have a lot of pitchers on my team. Cause yeah. I have a lot of kids who are comfortable getting on the mound because of how much we worked off the mound for all of them. Yeah. And like, 
you know, I mean, my my kid was one who, uh, you know, planned for, I think, the first time in some some decent heat. Uh, I could tell when he got out of that second inning, man, he was he was pretty fried. And I don't know what the conversation was, but like I was watching, you know, I was watching his stuff and the, the kid that he was pitching against um, was throwing harder than him. You know, like that that kid was touching touching seventy nine. Mm-hmm. He had a couple seventy nines in the box. He like, did great. Yep. Like love it. Love to see it. Love to see our kids to be able to go up against that too. Um, and you know, and and, and, my, and hit it. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to bury the lead, but yeah. Uh, and and then to see you know my kid up there and he's finding you know seventy seven seventy eights. You know, he pr'd in the mocap lab at like seventy eight seven. Um, caveat you know you've got all these markers on your whatever right but like he's done this enough he's been doing it since he was like nine mm-hmm. so he knows that his job in the mocap lab is just let it eat so when i see him you know pump 78 in a game right now it's like okay i know that the the output is up but uh as the output goes up you know the fatigue is going to kind of naturally go along with it i don't know that there is a mechanical panacea you can get to where those two things there isn't a link you know like 100 percent. it just isn't and it's like um you know there's a local high school kid that that i know who um i think he uh he hit an in-game pr of 92 on the last pitch of a cg and like that's tight you know like that that is tight that is absolutely what you want to see that kid is going to be going to a big d1 like it's it's pretty cool uh, and the fact that he's able to kind of like maintain and hit that velocity in his last, you know, on the last bullet tells you that like he's taken his, he's, he's, he should be taking some type of program series. I don't know what he's doing, but like the, the workload has obviously been built up to the point that he's, he's acclimated to mm-hmm. that and he can still pump. Um, I think with younger kids, you know, again, like not to put mine on a spot, when you see the 78s are starting to happen there and then you see like the 77, 76, it's like, okay, you know, we're we're losing something a little bit. And um, I think that'll continue to improve and develop. Again, like it's an acclimation that you'll build up to over time. Uh, but I like the fact that he's going to be given the space to progressively grow into that because we have 10 kids that can pitch as opposed to the other thing. Right. Which is like, look, man, you're going to have to throw five today. Yep. And if 78, 77 turns into 67, 69. It would have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it like we've seen it. Yeah. Like we, we've seen it. And that's just the thing where, um, you know, again, there there's enough linkage out there between uh, fatigue and mechanical breakdown and some sort of mechanism of injury, right? Like mm-hmm. I... I don't know that we know definitively enough to say, and I'm probably guilty of this, of going like fatigue, mechanical breakdown, injury. It, there's probably more to it than that. But um, correlation causation, right? Like there's there's some smoke in the water there, man, that I, I would be very concerned about. Um, so, yeah, it's really easy to just go like, yeah, you know, you just need more pitchers on your roster. Uh, the challenge that I would throw out is that like you have to start making that decision in January or maybe in October because it's going to take some time to build. And then you also need to, I think, have some perspective on the incentive structure about like games and approach to tournaments and stuff like that, Um, which kind of moves into the next thing, which is like, okay, well, you've got 10 pitchers and you've got 10 kids that can get on the bump out of a team of 12 to 13 or whatever uh, playing time distribution. How do you come up with the plan? I mean, the, the so, you know, you because because my guess is, is that you kind of build, you know, you build the the lineup and the rosters out the way that you think the team is going to be most competitive, competitive. But then there's the trailing thing of like, well, we need experience. Some of these kids need experience in some of these positions. You have to give it to them. Right. How? Yeah. So this is where I say, uh, you know, you talked right as we opened the pod about uh the mothers or wives who put up with like the constant, like thinking about like, what is the lineup? What did I like all this stuff? And, and I am single. So I did not, I do not have someone who's like, Hey man, uh, you are spending way too much time thinking about this, but yeah. Uh, it's a couple of beers and like two and two hours basically of me sitting down mapping out the week. So we had a game Tuesday, we had a game Wednesday, we had a game Saturday, and then we had a doubleheader Sunday. Um, and I've got 10 kids on my roster. 
not 10 pitchers, 10 kids. They all yeah. pitch, but I've got 10 kids. Yeah, because uh, we, moved, we moved a kid up um, as appropriate. And, yep. Yeah. We, mo- we moved two kids two. to teams that were more yeah. appropriate yeah. for them, um, which developmentally was the right thing to do, mm-hmm. um, which is always going to be our North Star. Yep. Uh, but yet, it makes things a little harder in the interim when you've got a roster of 10 and you've got five games in six days, and the timing of, of, uh, yeah. of all of it was not great, right? So... Um, I knew, uh, you know, part of this is, is tricky where like, uh, I've got three catchers, uh, and I did have a guest playing with us this week. Who's uh, most likely going to join next year, um, who catches. So he helped out a bit. That was a a huge help. Um, so I have three primary catchers. Two of them are also, uh, Two of my three best pitchers, two of my four best pitchers. Uh, So that makes it tough because I don't want them pitching and catching on the same day. Uh, Last weekend, last weekend, two weekends ago, we had a tournament um, and didn't have a choice, right? Like one of them's got to pitch on Saturday and catch on Sunday. The other's got to pitch on Sunday and catch on Saturday. Uh, And it didn't go super well because both of them were kind of dead on Sunday. Uh, One from the pitching, one from the catching. And, like, they just didn't have their legs to yeah. catch, like, a full game on Sunday or pitch really well on Sunday because they just caught a full game the day before, uh, which, like, obviously presents its own problems, right? Yeah. So I'm sitting there like, I can't have either of those kids catch on Saturday, and both of them are going to start one of the two games on Sunday. So, like, that yeah. is a thing yeah. I knew I had to do. They can't throw, they can't pitch on Saturday, they can't catch on Saturday because I want them pitching on Sunday. So that was, like, the first choice I made. Because the doubleheader Sunday, I don't think anybody, um, whatever I told the kids, they knew uh, that that those were the ones that I was I was optimizing for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to try to to put our most competitive on, get team on the field on Sunday, and everything else is kind of like downstream from there. Um, so start off with that, with knowing that like, all right, our sub is going to catch Saturday yeah. the whole game uh, because I need to split Sunday between two other catchers. Um, so I kind of had my catching and pitching figured out for Sunday uh, for the most part and for catching on Saturday. And then it's, all right, now how do I manage the Tuesday and Wednesday games to make sure I'm giving myself enough pitching to get through the three games in the right. weekend? And it's, all right, these are midweek games. I'm capping kids at three innings right? and, and 45 pitches so that I can bring them back in some capacity over the weekend without feeling that I'm overworking them too much. Because you feel good about like a 40 <laughs> to 45 number being something that if we're playing, you know, we do that on a Tuesday, right. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to rest, right. uh, Saturday, gameplay, but but not pitching. Right. Yeah, you've got legs. Right. And then to be clear, uh, I don't follow Pitch Smart personally. Um, I think it's a fine bare minimum, uh, but I am way more careful than Pitch Smart is with my kids' arms. So... Um, even with them throwing, being capped at 45, Pitchmar tells me I could bring them back on that rest to throw full, right? Uh, and yeah. I was not planning on doing that. Uh, one of them did. One of them did end up going way more pitches than I thought uh, and never really ran out of juice and was great. Yeah. Um, and he pitched on Tuesday, and then I brought him back on, on Sunday. Um, and... So I knew all right, I will probably be able to get through Tuesday and Wednesday with three pitchers per game if I go like three, two, and two. Yep. Which is exactly what I did. Yep. And Tuesday, I don't think I've ever had a game go more perfectly to my script uh, yeah. than how Tuesday went. Yeah. Uh, so that was like a great start to the week. Got out of there, kept all three of those kids at a very reasonable amount of pitches and won that game. Uh, Wednesday was trending in the exact same direction. Yeah. Had one bad inning. And didn't end up winning the game, but had the, was able to follow the same plan. Yeah. So now I get to Saturday, and I know I've got 10 kids that are available to pitch that I have to spread out over the games. Uh, and I have one kid who's been struggling that I knew I was going to give. He was one of my starters when we started the year. And I knew I was going to give him an opportunity to start on Saturday, whether regardless of what I told him. Yeah. That was always my plan, uh, was to have him start on Saturday. Um, and I was just praying I would get six innings out of him. That was that was my goal. Uh, and like, if you had really put true serum in me, please give me three. Like, give me yeah, three sure. three yep. innings, three good innings from him. Yep. 
would have been what he needed mentally. Yep. And we would have been on a great path. Maybe I used two other pitchers in that game and then Sunday figured it out. Yeah, he went out and threw a complete game on Saturday. Uh, he shoved. He shoved. It was great. Yeah. Uh, he needed it. We needed it. So now I go into Sunday and I have nine kids available to pitch, which yeah. like made it way easier. Um, and like everything truly went according to the plan that I made three beers deep yeah. uh, after spending two hours sitting at a whiteboard, like yeah. mapping it all out. Um, did my crazy ass have nine different options for every single inning we played <laughs> on Saturday and Sunday based on, on pitching? Yes, I did. Let's go. Uh, because, you know, if I, I had a, I rotated my extra hitter throughout mm-hmm. the defense so I could give everybody an inning on the bench that they're not standing out there in 90 degree yeah. heat. Uh, cause they're just, they just were not used to it. Yeah. Um, so rotating guys through and like, all right, you're the reliever. If I need a man, any reliever, uh, I always wanted to start the second pitcher in the game, uh, like my actual second true starter, my piggyback starter, or whatever on a fresh inning. Yeah. So I had guys sitting in the dugout that are like, Hey, if he struggles out there, normally my cap is I'm not letting a kid ever throw more than 40 pitches in one inning. Mm-hmm. Yesterday, my cap was 30. It was hot. Yeah. I'm not letting a kid go over 30 pitches in a single inning. Uh, we're just like... And it's the first time... He's dying. We, and it's the first time we've really been out in that type of heat. In that type yeah. of heat. So my uh, when they hit pitch 20, I went out there with a water bottle uh, and, and took a, a mound visit with a water bottle. What, two? One for my catcher, one for my pitcher. Made sure they got some water and gave someone time to, to get hot in the bullpen. Yeah. Uh, and the plan was like, all right, if that guy comes in and finishes in the inning... I'll let him keep going until he's stops shoving or, or gets tired or whatever. Yeah. Um, I got through game one um, using basically two pitchers, uh, and then I had one kid yeah. start the seventh and throw 15 pitches, maybe. Yeah. Um, uh, he finished the sixth and then started the seventh. Through, I think he threw like 20 pitches uh, total. Uh, and then game two, I did have to empty the, the bench a little bit. I had yeah. four kids pitch in game two. Um, a three kids pitching game two, and I had a fourth ready to warm up in the bullpen. So I did use seven pitchers in those two in those two games just on Sunday yeah. because of how hot it was, and like we're facing a pretty good team. They're working counts. Like, yeah, I don't know if I hadn't gotten that complete game on Saturday, I'd have been in trouble. Yeah, we would have had some choices to make for sure. It would have either been a kid who's not comfortable because I have one kid who like. I know I can throw him on a mound and he's going to be fine. He'll be fine. He doesn't yet know that, so I need a soft landing spot. Um, No matter how much I tell him. Uh, I need a soft landing spot for him. It would have been him. Yeah. Uh, Because if it wasn't him, my other options were a kid who caught. Yeah, and I was just going to say. And I'm not going to do that. Yeah, the the big thing is the pitcher-catcher interplay is just, it's tough. Yeah. It makes the whole thing really, really tough. So so what's your process then for even moving away from like the high leverage positions, the highest leverage positions, uh, pitching and catching, and start to think about like field time behind it too, because that's the other part of it. Yep. Uh, So I only have one lefty uh, in the field. I have one lefty hitter, but he throws righty, and I have one lefty thrower, and he hits righty. Um. So he's the only one that's like slightly difficult because there's four positions I can play him at um, outside of pitcher. So like he he makes things a little bit more difficult and like he has struggled at a couple of the positions that he can play at. So like it's a soft landing spot for him too. Which is reasonable. I don't think there's anything wrong. No, not at all. Trying to put him in a a place where he's more likely to have success is not a bad thing. Right. That's my whole goal, right? Like I want to put these kids in a position to to, to be successful um, and not in a position where they, they haven't really played before. Um, and it's really about, um, rotating kids through, especially right after they pitch, um, making sure they wind up in left field, right field, second base. Like after they pitch every inning, they were in the dugout with me to like actually get a break and cool down. Um, and then it's really about like managing their workload for the rest of that game and making sure like, Hey, even if they're probably my best defender or like my best shortstop or my best center field. Like they're not going to go back there until the next game. Yeah. Because I can't in good conscience have them go straight from the mound to shortstop or straight from the mound to center field. Um, yeah. In and good like, conscience is the, is the, like, that's the, that's the thing, right? right. Because you very easily could. Right. And I, and I am putting, I am aware less, uh, 
competitive, not non-competitive, but less competitive kids in those premium defensive positions. And that's like something I I am just great with. Like I will live with that all day and send the message because, uh, you know, we talked about this on the bunting podcast, right? A lot of why we don't bunt is because of the message it sends. Yep. If I take a kid off the mound who is just gassed and I'm like, go play shortstop, that the message I'm sending to anybody else who could play shortstop is that you are not better than like this kid who can barely lift his arm right now. Right. Uh, who, who can barely like stand up because he needs water right now. And like, so what? You make an error. But you had to source out for a couple of innings, you make an error. So what? Who cares? Like, you're learning how to play a new position. You're figuring it out. Center field, same thing. And like, uh, we didn't, the one new kid I had playing short uh, made no errors. Uh, the kid I put in center field who I'd never put in center field before mm-hmm. made no errors was great. Yep. Caught multiple balls. Yep. Um, and like what I have found and I, I am aware that I've got talented kids on my team. Um, but what I found is if you trust them and they know you trust them, they're going to make most of those plays. They're, they're not, uh, they're not really going to be that much of a detriment on defense. It's only if you send that message early and often, that then you put them in that position and they're like, oh my God, I have to play shortstop. I've never played shortstop before. This is a close yeah. game. What do I do? As opposed to like, who cares? Like, I, I trust you to figure this out and make the plays. And like, if you miss a play, who cares? You're playing shortstop. You don't normally play shortstop. You'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. We'll be fine. Um, and again, but that's like really tough. And that's, a, that's an active choice, right? Yep. That like, I know... We're gonna get, we could get into a situation where easy ground ball to short, we botch the play, wheels come off, and now it's a long inning, and maybe I just force my pitcher to throw twenty five more pitches in this inning, or right. or now I got to change pitchers because his defense didn't back him up, and like now he's at thirty pitches this inning, and I got to just go get him out, and like that didn't happen, but I knew that it could have, and that's just like a choice that I have to make. Yeah, because I'm not willing to destroy arms at that point. And I think you know, uh, having that approach to workload distribution and playing time and all this other stuff. I mean that that part of it about about taking like a really gas kid and then putting them in a high leverage position and the signal that sends to every other kid on the team is is really 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 important and impactful. Um, and maybe there's a time for that. You know, but that time is probably not just like a regular season league game. Right. You know, like, I mean, it, it would be great if it didn't cost you anything, but it right. does. Right. It does. You know, like the only time that I ever let D go out to the limit uh, was in uh, his last uh, Little League All-Star game. We dropped the first one uh, and he started the second one. And it was just like, look, you know, you're either going to go. You're going to go to the limit because that sets us up the the, the ability to potentially go play a third game. And, and he did, and he went well, um, but he didn't get all the way through it. I think he got through like five and a third, and he reached, he reached limit. And it's like, uh, and again, this is part of the impact of mandatory rules because I could have, if it wasn't Little League and it wasn't a mandatory pitch smart, which again has, has issues, right. right? But because it's a mandatory rule set, I didn't have a choice about uh, moving him out. I had to move him out of that pitching position. Um, and if I didn't, uh, I can't remember what the consequences in All-Stars. I think either I would get ejected or whatever. I mean, there's there's some real serious stuff that can happen, right? As there should be. As there should yeah. be. Um, and I slid him out to short because I needed to – I wanted to make sure that we locked in those last two outs. We yeah. just had to get two more outs. Um, and I think he actually did end up having to make a play at short to get us out of that game. The point that I'm trying to illustrate is like there's a if there is a moment in time in so much as this is really ever a thing with prepubescent pre teenage age children or even with your teens at 13s, 14s, 15s. If you make choices that are in consideration of setting yourself up to be had to have like the highest likelihood of hell when you get to that choice, you get to make that choice with options. Right. If you burn them early and you have two, four, five kids on your team who are already toast, you don't have a choice. Right. You you just you just don't. Yep. 
and the multiple kids I would have used to play shortstop yesterday, and all of them played shortstop. Also, because of the nature of Sunday, every one of them either pitched or catched. Right. So it was I there were no good options there. Yep. So I rotated them through. I'm not gonna make you know, Danny played shortstop at the end of that game. In the seventh inning when I needed my best shortstop defender out there, he yeah. played shortstop or sixth inning or whatever it was. But I was rotating kids through. So like yep. I'm not gonna give you four innings at shortstop. I'll give you one and then I'm gonna move you to second and to right field and like save your arm a little bit. Yep. But I know that in a situation like that, and this is like a tournament environment, right? You have to make some of those choices where, like, I don't have a choice. Somebody who pitched or catched is going to have to play short and third and or third. And so the only option I have is to, like, rotate through those kids. Uh, And, like, that takes forethought of, like, making sure that, all right, like, I'm going to put the worst of these shortstop defenders the earliest in the game. Right. So as we get later into the game and the innings get more important, if you will, I have my better defenders out there. As opposed to like, I'm going to try to throw Danny at shortstop immediately, and then he's just completely cooked by the fifth inning, and now I got to go to somebody I trust less in the sixth and seventh. It's it's the foresight of like, okay, like I want him to play short at the end of this game. So like he's going to sit for multiple innings, and then he's going to play right field so that I can give his arm an hour off, yeah. an hour and a half off. Uh, and like... I mean, the, the mental gymnastics, though, is just like... It's like the, you know, it's the, it's the meme of like the arithmetic uh-huh. or whatever like 100%. Of, of literally trying to go through that. And, um, again, I, it's an active choice. Yeah, it is. And it's an active choice. And it's hard. It, it is, it's really hard to sit there and go through that. I understand that. Like, again, I'm single. Most people have wives. I'd be like, stop drinking and writing these lineups. <laughs> You were fine at option four. You're on option nine right now. That's you're n- you're never going to use option nine. It was like, oh, maybe I will. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. I used an option seven actually. Hey, so I like, got got pretty yeah. got pretty far down the list. Let's go. So like, I understand that like most coaches, I I I don't even ask our coaches to to do that much. I I probably care too much. Um, but like, that is a choice that has to be made at some point. And like what I do ask our coaches is to always prioritize health in this order, health development winning. And if you don't make an active choice there, you are putting yourself in a position where you don't have a choice to make. You don't have a choice. The choice is made for you. Which Um, we saw in our opponent who had half of their actual roster injured. uh, And they had to all like kudos to them. They only played two games this week. So it wasn't, a marathon like our week was, uh, but they had nine playable defenders for a doubleheader in 90 degree heat. Yeah. And they played every single one of those kids played every inning in the field because everyone else on their team had some sort of arm injury that they couldn't throw, which is like a tells you everything you need to know May 14th. Um, but also like that coach didn't have choices, right? There were no good choices to be made. No choice to make. Yeah. Um, so uh, batting order, plate appearance distribution is mm-hmm. that is that easier than uh, like taking taking kind of the raw playing time part out of it? How are you? What's the process of building just like that one through ten? Are you are we looking at it just like as a feel thing? Are you looking at numbers? Like what's the best way to kind of to kind of plot that course? Yep. So I uh, will generally uh, I have like a decent uh and i know some of my kids listen to this you know i love you so no oh, yeah that's all they, they know sorry about this well and and, and, and I'll, I'll give my own precursor to what you're gonna say if there are kids that are like uh middle bottom of of any of our teams not just yours but any of them the point is we're training all of them to be like two through four hitters right they might not be there yet but that doesn't believe we don't believe they're going to get there eventually. And I want to be uh, clear, as I told them yesterday, uh, I I don't have six, seven, eight, nine, ten hitters. I have ten kids. I have nine kids who hit the ball at eighty miles an hour. Yep, or more. Or more. Yeah. Uh, and then one kid who has a five hundred on base percentage uh, and is a year and a half younger than most of the kids on the team. Uh, And he's 
hitting balls at 70, he just hasn't like fully grown in, and I am not worried about him in nope. any way. Um, so like everyone in my lineup can run into one and, oh. and crush a ball. And we've seen it. Uh, so the way I do my lineup is I have a pretty clear, uh, I have a pretty clear top four hitters. Um, all of them are OPSing at least 1.1 1. 1 right now. Yeah. Uh, and just hitting the shit out of the ball. We uh, will. I, I try not to swear on this podcast. Sorry, Paul. Um, Somebody told me that like YouTube really or like some of these algorithms they really only check like the first couple minutes that they're they're scanning for stuff. Oh. So maybe it's just like you to know clean for the first couple minutes, last couple minutes, and then just yeah. let it go in between. Yeah, just right. send it. Fuck um, it. <laughs> I'm just gonna fuck it, Chloe. Bleep that one out. Um, so I have a pretty clear top four hitters. Um, None of those four have moved all at all all season. Um, and like I go a little old school, uh, and if opponents are listening to this, they're gonna get a little bit here, but like um I have a kid who loves to hit lead off. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna hit him lead off because he's one of those four best hitters and he really loves hitting lead off. And I enjoy how aggressive he is early in the count. Mm-hmm. He doesn't let a pitcher get settled early in the game, so like I'm happy to have him hit yeah. lead, hit lead off. Um, of those four, uh, the second highest, um, on base is the one who hits two. Yeah. He's probably the least, uh, well, so I have my leadoff hitter at one of the next three. The one who is the least slugging is my two hitter. And then my three and four hitters are my big bats. Yeah. So I want my one and two to get on base for my three and four hitters. That's kind of how I stack those top four. Yep. And it works. Those those kids are hit, are are uh, doing very well. Yep. Uh, my fifth hitter is the one that's like, honestly, way closer to the top four than the bottom half of the lineup. So he's just kind of like entrenched in four, and six is not that far off uh, oh, yeah. from what that is. Yeah. Um, I could flip them. Um, I won't for a while. The way they're at five and six, uh, five is a little bit more of an aggressive hitter, and six is a little bit more of a an on base guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Generally, uh, if my top four do well, there's going to be some people on base, and I want a guy who's going to be aggressive. Yeah. So, and he's driven in, he's done a great job driving yes. in runs. Yep. So, he's been in my five hole, and then I have my six hole. Uh, my seven, eight, nine, ten hitters um, have struggled a little bit this year at various times. Um, all of them have found barrels, uh, and I have faith that they will continue to find barrels. Uh, but at this point, they're not cracking the top six uh, of the lineup. So um, basically, seven, eight, and nine uh, continue to kind of move based on who's hot yeah. at the moment. Um, and it's it's very much a, like a meritocracy, and they know that. Uh, all my boys know that, like, you can be moved up and down this lineup. I, I redo the lineup, which I truly do. I sit there and look at, like, the lineup and redo it before we play every game. Uh, there just hasn't been any change in the the numbers of the top six guys. So like those guys have been the top six because yeah. like they're not losing those spots. Uh, but those, those seven, eight, nine will rotate through those three um, depending on how hot they are, things like that. Um, one Generally what I will do is I will take my hitter who's slumping the most and have him hit nine. Um, try to hide him a little bit in the lineup, give him a little bit of a, uh, of a soft landing. Yeah. Um, and then my 10 hitter is always the way I view it is, is my second lead off. Yeah. Uh, I want a guy who's got a high on base percentage. Who's going to get on base in front of the top of the order. Uh, because a lot of times teams look at that. Um, and, Oh, next guy's the top of the order. This guy's an easy out. And I want a guy who's like not an easy out. Who's going to make him work for it. And then all of a sudden gets on base and now they go top of the lineup, but there's already a guy on base to like kind of distract him. Um, and I've got a kid who's really good at that. Um, so, so, for, so for numbers, is it is it just kind of like uh, on base percentage and then slugging and then OPS? Kind of just like are those the three that you're kind of largely making those decisions off of? Yep. Are you looking? And I, and we already kind of established the fact that basically everyone on the team is 80 mile an hour EV and up. Yep. Um. So you're kind of balancing all that stuff together to try to make a decision and not yeah. looking. And the thing I'm the thing I'm getting towards is like really not specifically paying a ton of attention to batting average. I was just gonna say that. So this is where you know we are. Uh, we use Game Changer, um, and it's uh, a bit hit or miss 
uh, because it's up to somebody to call those errors or sure. base hits, right? Yeah. So uh, the batting average can be really misleading. Um, I OPS tends to not be because it's did you get on base and did you slug? Yeah. Um, once I get past the first four, the thing I honestly look at the most is uh, a combo. Well, it's really strikeout percentage. Um, if you're striking out a lot, you're going to move down uh, because if our top six hitters do their job, seven is going to have guys on base, eight is yep. going to have guys on base, and I don't want us striking out with guys on base. We've done that a good amount of times this year. Um, so I look at strikeout percentage a lot because that's another one that, like, no matter who's running Game Changer, it is, it's true, whatever the strikeout percentage is. I look at yeah. number of pitches per plate appearance, uh, specifically for the guy who's going to hit 10. Uh, making sure that like he is making those guys work and yeah. and 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 not rolling over the back half of the line, right? Yeah, and yeah. and making them sweat before they get to yep. the leadoff hitter a little bit. Um, and um, I look at and this one's trickier. Uh, I have to use my memory a little bit here, but I look at um, really it's like ground ball percentage versus line drive percentage mm -hmm. uh, slash fly ball because fly ball line drive is extremely subjective. Subjective. Yeah. Um, and guys who are hitting a lot more ground balls, uh, I also move later in my lineup because yeah. uh, I want guys who are going to hit the ball in on a line, uh, but if not on a line, in the air at least. Yeah. Um, now, I wish there was a pop out percentage because like that's a thing too, right? Like that, those yeah. are a lot of times considered fly balls to second base or whatever, and that sucks. Um, so that's where I have to like not be a slave to the game changer numbers and and remember like yeah. what happened and things like that. Um, but yeah, those are the things that I look at, like number of pitches per plate appearances, uh, strike percent, uh, strikeout percentage, um, on base slugging ground ball, fly ball, line yeah. drive. Um, and like not for nothing. I also know these kids really well. So like, I, yeah. I have a pretty good feel of like where, like what the talent level is like and like, uh, more specifically, cause again, the only real movement at this point is seven, eight, nine, uh, unless something drastic changes. Um, and most of that, to be honest, is going to be based off a of mental state. Um, Which is another huge component of this whole thing that we've right. been talking about when you're talking about, like, children. <laughs> right. You know, just, like, where they are, how, how successful or, or unsuccessful, how they were in the last weeks of, of, uh, of practice, how are they generally kind of responding to challenges, what type of perseverance are they expressing or not right. expressing as they kind of go through the game and, and all this other stuff. And you, you have to, uh, you got to kind of know your team's temperature, Yeah. but then individually, like how these kids are all responding. And again, man, like we go back to the same thing about like the meme of the, the math equations. It's like you're doing that same thing, but you're doing that thing about like, how confident do I believe this kid is going to be when they get the next opportunity? Yeah. How are they going to respond? Right. And I had, um, you know, we, I don't know if this was on your plans to talk about later, but uh, that first game, uh, we're playing a really good team, mm -hmm. uh, the best team in our division. Um, we're in third place, they're in first. This was like games we wanted to win. And uh, we got, it was 3 3 uh, going into the bottom, bottom, bottom six, top seven, bottom five. It's 3 3 going bottom five. Um, and I'll blame the heat stroke. And uh, we we had a little bit of a rough inning. We had a couple of uh, and like one of uh, two of the runs actually, two of their three runs scored on uh, stolen base attempts to third, and the ball getting the third baseman who's a little bit more raw of a baseball player, um, trying to make the tag instead of just catch the ball yeah, and it going in the left yeah. field and like a really rough outfield that took some weird bounces. Um, and then that, in that fifth, uh, two balls directly through his legs, um, through the wickets, man, it through was, the wickets. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Every part of me wanted to make sure he wasn't at third base next inning. And like, I, I, I can't like, we're now down six to three going into the top of the sixth. Um, in my head, I'm like, all right, if we put up runs here and take a lead, I cannot put him back at third. Yeah. Uh, I just can't do it. Um, I mean, the biggest concern is that like 
for his mental state. Cor- yeah. Correct, because you know, like w- when I was watching the second ball, the second ball was just defined by the first one. One hundred percent. It was literally you know? the exact same, exact yep. same ball. Yep. Uh, and then I'm sure you saw as soon as like first one wasn't terrible body language. Second one just like. Yeah. And and, uh, and that kid's a dog too. Right. So I'm sitting there trying to decide because uh, we got a whole another second game to play. Yep. Uh, and he was my second pitcher for that second game. Uh, so I'm sitting there trying to decide, do I move him off of third? What's the move? And we are quiet in the sixth. And so now we're in the bottom of the sixth, and I'm just like, I'm going to let him play third. Before he went out there, I said, that's in the past. Yep. I trust the hell out of you. I wouldn't put you back out there if I didn't. Yep. Um, I don't think any balls got hit to him, but whatever. Uh, but you know that every time the pitch was coming in that he was like – yeah. Because so he, he doesn't want to let the team down again. He doesn't want to let himself down again. Like, you don't, yeah. Correct. Yeah. And he isn't the kid, and I have a couple of these on my team. He's not the kid that if I had taken him out, he's going to sit on the bench or sit in right field or wherever I put him yeah. and just, like, think about the, like, he would definitely think about those errors, but he's still in the game. His yeah. head's in the game, yep. whereas some other kids might yep. not be. Um, so whatever, I kept him in. And I made the choice that, like, I'm my goal is to, like, save his mental state for game two when I need him to pitch right. and just, like, gas him up and like hey it's in the past i trust you if i didn't trust you i wouldn't put you back out there there's nobody better like whatever we get to the top of the seventh and Man. and uh two quick outs and then we put together a little bit of a rally uh it was i've coached this team for a long time and that was some of the most fun i've had in an inning yeah. coaching these boys and it all started with two outs he's up with two outs in the time run second they, they call time to go ice him and they go talk mm-hmm. to the pitcher or whatever. Yeah. And I come up to him and he's like, he looks okay. Like he looks like pretty relaxed or whatever. And uh, the other coach, I watched the other coach listen to me talk to him. Uh, and I knew that he was listening because like we're standing near their dugout and yeah. whatever. Uh, and I straight up told him like, find some grass or don't. I love you either way. Just go have fun. Finish this game strong. And he proceeds to double down the right field line and tie the game. And it was really cool. Yeah. Because, like, I could have taken that kid out of the game mentally because he still would have been in my lineup. Mm -hmm. But I could have taken him out of that game where, like, if he doesn't get that next inning at third, maybe he does go go take that at bat thinking, I cost my team four runs today. Sure. Because he did cost his team four runs. Uh, It was 6-6. It very well could have been 6-2 if we hadn't made all those errors at third. And instead, he goes and, and hits that double. And, like, the, these are choices that you make that, like, sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. Um, but I would contend that even when they don't work, they kind of work a little bit down the road. And the challenge as a youth coach, because you're talking about kids and we're not, you know, we're not building rosters to go win a natty. You know, we're not building a roster to, to make sure that everybody, um, you know, ideally gets a new contract from the GM next year. It's a challenge, and the kids will challenge you to see how much trust you can put into them, right? They, they, they will literally trust that, and sometimes they will intentionally uh, challenge it because they're kids, and sometimes they're going to act like kids, and sometimes it's just a challenge because they don't know how good they really are. Yeah, you know, and, like their their belief in their own selves is is very tenuous a lot of times, and it's like when I think about that kid, man, uh, he's a he's a dog of a competitor. He's he's and he's he's so good, and he's also a little green too. Oh yeah. So it's like, man, you don't even realize how good you. He does are not know how good he is. Yeah. Considering how good you are and how green you are, and in that kid, again, there's a choice. Am I going to give this kid the rope to show him that I trust him? give him an opportunity to be successful in this thing or am i more interested in not harnessing that learning opportunity but maximizing my ability to like mitigate risk right and i'm i'm sitting there in the dugout right like not only am i trying to send that message to him but now i have two separate messages that i can send to my kids and it's really hard to choose between those two one of them is uh your teammate has struggled today and he's given up basically four unearned runs at third base um I want to put you all in a better situation to win, a better spot to win, because I recognize that like we would be up in this game right now yep. if that hadn't happened. So I'm going to take him out 
and put somebody else in and like send the message to everybody that like, hey, like we're going after this. Like we're yeah. gonna win this thing. Or I can send the message that like you can make errors, it's okay, and I can still I'll still trust you. And I chose the second one. And that also comes with making sure you message it out to the team because they also need to know because they'll lose the trust in that kid. And like Yeah. They can feel yeah. when they lose trust in each other. Yep. And like if you've got a pitcher who was shoving on that mound, he got really frustrated. And he got six outs in that inning. Yep. And he got really frustrated. And it was, I know, I know how frustrated you got. I'm going to send you back out there next inning, and I'm going to send him back out there next inning. Yeah. And like, I'm kind of putting him, his development over yours. If you want to put it that way, right? Like, sure, but I'll Because also- he may do it again to you. And you may get stuck on the mound with your, with your defense making errors, but like, when you make errors in center field, I'm gonna put you right back out there, and like that's how we work as a unit of like we got to pick each other up or whatever. Um, I mean, I would just I would argue that like that choice has some holistic benefit in the signal that it sends to all these kids about the way that they're going to be treated yeah. and the way that they respond to to competition and the way that they you know either demonstrate their ability to persevere or not, you know, if, if he had gone back out there and made another error, that would have been a real bummer. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can't, you can't even control that, right? Like you can't control, like, you know, we, we just spent all this time like talking about how we're going to try to move kids from place to place to kind of mitigate, mitigate workload and give them rest and, and do that stuff in consideration of everything they've done before, whether that's pitching, catching, etc. You can't control it. I mean, we're, we're, we're just largely kind of bet hedging. You know, uh, but you want kids, we talk about this all the time in the game, who can respond to adversity and push through, right? Yep. It's, it's like, how, how are you going to respond? Well, uh, as a coach, uh, the first signal that you send to tell a kid that, like, I have no trust in you is you don't give them an opportunity to respond. Right. That's the, fir- that's the first thing. Well, and then the other part is the next time you do, they feel like this is my last opportunity. Yeah, and then they're playing with a ton of fear, and and they are terrified of making a mistake because then what happens to my playing time? And so like that is another thing I'm not willing to do. Yeah, um, and I and I get that there is a level of that game where it's reasonable to make those type of choices. I totally understand that. Yeah. Varsity high school, obviously college, and obviously the pro level. Like that's, but again, I would even argue, you know, high school select ball. Sure. You're, you're at that level already. Like these kids are playing JV or varsity already. Yeah. Like y- us not doing that is not, uh, really preparing them to play in high school. If we're. Yeah, that's real. So. That's real. They're, they're going to have to deal with that stuff. But, but, you know, in so much as, you know, 14, you and down should function to acclimate kids to where they're going to be eventually. If you don't want a kid that's 50 in you, that's rattled, super terrified to make a mistake, always thinks they're playing with a short leash, then don't treat them that way at right. 14 you on down. Right. Don't do that. And again, I've been, I know we talk about this group of kids a lot on the podcast, but I've been with them for quite a while now. Uh, and they're um, generally, especially in here, not a group that lacks confidence. No. And... It can be hard for someone to who doesn't maybe know them as well to understand uh, just how fragile their sense of ability is in themselves, right? Whether it's your kid in the last tournament we had uh, having the day of his life on Saturday, yep. struggling a little bit on Sunday, and like he was so happy at the end of Saturday, yeah. And so down at the end of Sunday. Yeah. And it's like, dude, this is like literally yesterday you were great. Like this didn't, you're not great. Or you're not not great because you had a bad day. Yeah. We had the same thing Sunday, right? Like our pitcher who dominated on Saturday struggled a little bit with the bat on Sunday. Yep. And lost all faith in himself. Yep. Uh, and like you... People really don't have like a good sense of like just how fragile that is and how quickly kids can get down on themselves and like lose total faith in their ability to do anything and how frequently you need to gas these kids up and like show them you and it's 
I tell them all the time. And that's fine. But it's the if you say one thing and then you do and then you pull them out of the game. Like if you say like I trust the hell out of you. Yep. Uh no matter how many errors you make, I trust you to play third. I'm going to put you back in that game. Uh if I say that all the time and then when it actually gets to that point in the game, then I take them out. All my words don't mean anything. Well, and the, and the kids are emotionally intelligent enough to see the the dissonance between those two things, right? Right. Like they they absolutely are, and they're hypersensitive to it because their own sense of self is not burned in. Right. You know, like they they're just not there yet. It's like uh, one of the first for movies. One of the first movies my, I remember my dad ever taking me to was a movie called Megaforce. I challenge you to go look up Megaforce uh, on your own free time, and I don't even I don't even know if you can stream it. I'm sure you can probably stream it because you can stream everything anywhere. But just go Megaforce movie like 1984 or whatever, and go to Google Image Search and look at the cover. It's preposterous because it's like a early 80s action movie that's just like there's like flying motorcycles and all this other ridiculous stuff. But the poster, this is so dumb, but like I remember. Uh, my dad took me to this movie and took me to like opening night of it. And the bottom of the poster it says deeds, not words. Fuck yeah, yeah. man, let's go. Yeah. And of course, like it appeals to my, you know, early 80s G.I. Joe. Like, the, I mean, of course, I was I was in the mix there. But like, man, it's it's deeds, not words. And children are just like inherently hypersensitive to not only the way that they perceive their own flaws and they like magnify that mm-hmm. stuff and then minimize their accomplishments. But they're also like hypersensitive to the signal that they get sent from the people that they trust. Yeah. And if that trust isn't reciprocal, that's the that's the, that's the only signal that they need to go like, well, I certainly can't trust myself. Right. Why would I? Because right. because no one else believes in me. Right. If you want these kids to be conditioned to cultivate the sense of perseverance that this game is going to necessitate, if they're going to play it for a while, then they need to be extended trust by the adults in their area of influence when they struggle. Yep. Otherwise, you're just going to get kids that are super tight and they're super scared to play this game. Yep. And you're talking about a game that inherently has a shitload of failure baked into it. That's not how you grow a fucking baseball player. Yep. That's just not it. Because uh, what I will, what I'm fairly confident in is that they're going to blame somebody or something. Of course. No matter what, even if it's something they can't even control, like not, not even remotely control. Somebody has to get blamed because it's just like the way their brain works. Like they're going to, and it's not kids, it's adults do it all the time too, right? Like somebody's got to get, take the blame for this. Um, and 99% of the time, 90% of the time, it's them. The other 10% is they blame on their teammates. Um, but like either way, nobody else is being blamed. It's me or yep. my family yep. that's out here. And like those are just both like extremely toxic things that that's like 90% of coaching is just like making sure they're not blaming themselves when yeah. these things go wrong. And like, it's okay. It happens. Yeah. Uh, like we have to move past it. Cause if you're sitting there blaming somebody inherently, uh, someone did something wrong to deserve the blame. Right. And you, making an error doesn't mean you did something wrong. Right. Like maybe it took a bad hop on you. And like a big one, uh, my center fielder was very down on himself after the game yesterday because he struck out three times. All three times looking on pitches that were a foot off the plate. Um, yeah, I mean, we're yeah, it was like two and a half baseballs. I mean, I, every other at bat that he didn't strike out, he got a base hit, mm-hmm. a line drive base hit, had at least one double, yeah, uh, a beautiful gap double yep. too, just picture perfect. Man. Um, and. Not for nothing, shoved on the mound. Yep. Uh, but at the end of the game, I could see that he was down, and he said, I struck out three times. That's what you're taking away from today? <laughs> My God. But, but what like, does that tell you about teenagers? Right, you know? right, like, right. Which yeah, is, I, I think, that brings up to the next thing you wanted to talk about. Yeah, the team culture thing, right? Like the, the you know, because again, I think largely when we start to think about team culture, we're, we're largely talking about the way that we approach competition. Yep. Um, Certainly the foundation of that stuff is laid in training and practice, but competition is its own thing because, you know, there's a team on the other side that has different laundry on than us. And we all have these moments where we are going to react to it individually and then as a team and how 
you know, how, how do you send signals as a coach to like effectively compel the choices and behavior that you want the group to start to exemplify, you know, like that, that's the thing. Um, and it's a tricky thing because of everything that we just talked about. It's like, you know, I, Danny came up to me between games. He's like, I feel like I haven't gotten a barrel in, in whatever, whatever. And, uh, <laughs> and amusingly, uh, less than, <laughs> less than 24 hours before, uh, he hit a ball like 310 oppo. Yeah. And, um, and, and I was like, I was like, all right, uh, let me try to unpack this. It's like, well, what, what are you trying to do at the plate? And he's like, well, I'm trying to get a hit. What does that mean? He's like, well, I don't know. Like, I want to get a hit. Yeah, I know. But what does that mean? He's like, well, well I, I don't know, man. I was like, all right. Uh, again, it's not my job as his parent to be his coach anymore. Like, that's just not the role anymore. So I was like, all right. I said to him, I was like, look, uh, we're going to take uh, two rounds of eight. We're going to take 16 swings between these two games. These 16 swings are not going to change your life at all. I said, the only thing that we need to focus on is just like, what's the, what are we trying to do? Be on time, hit fucking piss rods. Excuse me. I, I have no business telling him anything other than that, because number one, I'm not trying to get involved in any technical instruction that like his coach is giving him. That's not my place. What's the appropriate thing? Be on time and hit piss rods. So, that, so you know, Danny, he gets a couple, and then uh, and then uh, Henry comes down, one of the other kids on the team. He's like, can I? And I literally, it's like, all right, well, if this is the thing that's happening, I'm going to regurgitate the exact same thing because I'm not your coach, and I'm not going to be that dad who's like, I'm I'm suggesting anything that imparts any color on the team culture choices and approach to competition that you guys have. The thing that I know that we both agree on unilaterally be on time and hit piss rods. One other player comes down and I give him the exact same speech. Cause I just, I can't, I'm not, we're halfway into our season, yeah. right? This stuff in terms of team culture uh, is getting established right now. Kids just need some coaching through it, right? And it's not like we're just going to, you know, it's not like a college team where it's like we're going to get everybody in the locker room and we're going to put some, you know, something up on the whiteboard. And these are the four focuses of what we're going to have for the year. And this is what we're going to exemplify. And then you're going to have college kids who struggle to do that stuff. 14. Yeah. So this same advice goes for everybody 14 on down. What's the cultural identity? How do you set it? And then how do you communicate it and substantiate it? Yep. You know, like, and everybody I think has to make that same decision for themselves relative to the kids that they have and the approach that you want to take to winning this game. Uh, I would just hope that everybody can kind of, well, this is a hope because I know this isn't going to happen. <laughs> if you can agree that, that competitors children and adults are largely going to play their best when they're playing with whatever this like flow state idea of um gosh who's the guy that wrote the book uh, the hard thing about hard things steve um steve magnus oh, i'm gosh, butchering or his last name but it's the hard thing about hard things um he put this thing up on uh on his socials uh, last week he was talking about this idea of like clutch right They've done some research studies about like how how people that are perceived to be clutch respond to situations and like what are the characteristics of that response. And the thing that he that he kind of hammered on that is like burned into my brain now is that it's not a threat, it's a challenge. Threats are things that we perceive to be dangerous to us, right? It impacts my own sense of self and you can uh, rewind the tape on every other like rant that I've given about Gene Piaget and developmental psychology and children to understand why that stuff is real. You can also apply that to a way that we as parents and adults react to the competition failures of children in an extreme emotional sense, because it's a fear thing. It's a threat thing. If you flip it and instead it's just a challenge, well, I can respond to a challenge and I can evaluate my response to that challenge and identify areas that I want to focus on in the aftermath thereof. Threats don't have that type of response. Right. What you want is you want to treat it like a flipping challenge. Yeah. You know, hence enter Joe Boo. Yeah. We, I mean, we lost, we, we 
we're under 500 last year. Um, yeah, decidedly. Yeah. We, we won a lot of good games. Most of our losses kind of got our ass whooped. Um, like not, there were, there weren't a ton of losses that I look back on last year and I'm like, man, we were like, we were right there. It was just like, ah, that team is probably better than us. Mm -hmm. And like, that's okay. And that's, and that's an, that's an okay assessment. Right. You know? Uh, I have not felt that way a single time this year. Uh, we're four and six in league play. Uh, we've lost four games by one run. Um, we're, we are like so close. We're right there. Um, we had our worst loss in league play on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, we played Tuesday, beat the team, came back, played the same team Wednesday. Uh, it was honestly looked exactly like Tuesday, and the wheels came off in the fifth inning. The wheels came off in the fifth inning, and we allowed seven in the fifth. Um, and it went from a, a two to one lead to an eight to two deficit, and then we just like it just spun. Yeah, it just spun. Couldn't couldn't overcome it. And lost ten to three. Um, we've we've gotten down multiple times this season, and we have fought back and made yep. like massive comebacks because like our bats four times, all four times, and yeah. all those are the four one loss games, yep. one run loss games. Yep. We fight back from these deep holes right. and then just can't finish. Yeah. And uh, the last year they gave up early when they looked and they were like, ah, oh, we are not better than this team. They just they gave up and there was nothing I could do that could like keep them in these games. Uh, this year I'm watching them give up in that ten to three game, knowing how much better we are than this team. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, we could also put up a seven run inning right now. We're just, everybody's heads are hanging. There were some errors made. Kids are blaming each other. Kids yeah. are blaming themselves, whatever. So uh, I decide on Wednesday night that I'm going to switch it up over the weekend. Uh, because is the, I knew going into our season, this was like probably the most trying week we we're going to have. We had mm -hmm. five games in six days. It was with the big two being on Sunday. And it was like, I knew this was going to be a tough week. So I was like, I got to reset after that loss Wednesday. I got to reset and like make it fresh for, for the weekend. So that like, you know, whatever. And so trying to not be too Joe madden -y, but a little bit Joe madden -y. I mean, a little uh, bit sprinkling of Joe. Yeah, I, I, I am a big Joe Madden fan. Uh, mostly, most of the time, most of the time. Um, and trying to figure out how to like keep it fun and light while... Um, like sending a, a message and, and trying to change the culture a little bit from, from getting down on ourselves and each yeah. other. So enter Jobu. Uh, I get a Jobu figurine, uh, and Saturday before the game, uh, literally like five minutes before the game starts, uh, I have the team come and crowd around my backpack and I present them with Jobu, their newest teammate. Uh, I, I sit him down, uh, like in, in the dugout and, uh, he's the baseball guy. Uh, yes. you, when things that are not in your control go wrong, blame him. Yeah. You can absolutely blame him. Yeah. It's his fault. Every single time that something doesn't go our way and it's in our control and it's not in our control, it's his fault. However, if we have bad attitude and bad effort, he's going to make more things not go our way. So we can't blame him from those things. Mm -hmm. uh, honestly, I didn't know. As I'm sitting there thinking this whole thing through, I'm like, are the boys just going to look at me like we are way too old for this or, or to like, have they not seen major league or they, Oh, not, not one of them has seen major league. They were, Danny they has. Okay. He didn't say that. Uh, most of them had no idea who this thing was when I pulled it out of my backpack and they were just like, what is that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> most of them like had no, like didn't figure out what the actual name was until the third or fourth inning. They came like Jubo or whatever. Sure. Great. Um, <laughs> But I was like, are they are they gonna roll their eyes at me yeah. and be like a bunch of teenagers that are yeah. just like, this is stupid, coach. What are we doing? Uh, they could not have taken it better, uh, <laughs> and it really made a massive impact on our game on Saturday yeah. and the way we played on Sunday. Uh, with them telling each other, Joe was watching when they would have bad body language or the effort wasn't great. So instead of yelling at your teammate to be better and have better effort job was watching is a, a much better thing for them to say. Sure. Sure. Because now there's a third party. Involved. There's a third party to blame. Yep. yep. Right. And then when, uh, Tay hits an absolute piss rod with runners on second and third directly at the left fielder in a huge situation, 
like he he has found a bunch of barrels and has not found a lot of grass. Yeah. And like just the epitome of his season was like that rocket line drive yeah. directly into the kid's glove. And he came back and I just I go back to the dugout and I see him sitting there face to face with Joe Boo swearing at him. And I'm like, this is what I needed. <laughs> like, this is great. Blame it on him. It's not you did everything right there. Yep. He's the reason you didn't. And then as a coach, uh, we got real gassed yeah. toward like the second game was close until uh, we just totally ran out of Steven like the fifth inning. And um, our body language uh, and our attitude got came, came down with our effort level. Yeah. Every level is understanding when it's 90 and you're playing your sixth game, yep. your fifth game in six days, the attitude can't change. And the attitude got bad too. And I told them a couple times, hey, body language is not good right now. The attitude's not good. Like, we got to pick ourselves up, get off the mat. And we just didn't. Yeah. And they were gassed. And that's okay. Uh, but after the game, what happened in the fifth, sixth, and seventh innings of that game, really the sixth and seventh innings, mm-hmm. A million ground balls that found holes and a bunch of bloop singles. Uh, they they hit one ball hard and ended up scoring eight runs, eight runs, yeah, nine runs, nine yeah. runs in the last two innings. Uh, and it was all like seeing eye singles and like bloops. And it's like, yeah, Jobu did that because <laughs> your body language was bad, yeah, and like your attitude was bad. I get that you may run out of steam and your effort, yeah, may slightly go down. But if your attitude is also down, like he's gonna punish you or whatever, and it worked better than I, I like yeah. could have planned. Um, but I needed something for them to blame that wasn't themselves or each other, because yeah. uh, it was just like it's very easy for for that to be exactly what it turns into. Yeah, and like no matter how many times I tell them, all we can do is control what we can control. Like, yeah, they're upset that like I hit the shit out of that ball and it went directly to some kid's glove, and like I can't buy a base hit. Yep, that's his fault. It's not yeah. your fault. You're doing everything you can right. Yeah. That's his fault. You can blame it on him. That's fine. Yeah. And like, it worked better than I could have expected of them like really shifting the blame from themselves. And you saw it early and often yep. shifting the blame from themselves to the stupid little figurine <laughs> and like kissing him, rubbing his head when everything's, you know, like yeah. they, they would hit a line drive directly into a glove. They come back, they rub his head like, yeah. please, like next time, come on, please. Yeah. Like, He's he is now a member of the team, uh, and it, it and my stupid little uh, Joe Madden ploy worked uh, to perfection. Um, and if that's what I needed to do to get the kids to learn to not blame themselves when every tiny little thing goes wrong, yeah. uh, so be it. Yeah, I mean sometimes you know the other sometimes the other guy is just in the right spot and they make a great play. And you did everything right, yep. and it turns into a flipping zero. Yep. And it sucks, and it's it's really like unfulfilling, and that unfulfilling nature of it is the exact thing that like it's very easy to turn that into. Well, uh, I would have got a better pitch there if if you hadn't you know if you hadn't popped out on the first one, right? Or I mean, there's just all this this negative spiral there. Yep. And, um, and again, insert previous rant about dealing with children, and uh, you know, I don't know. At, at the end of the day, um, I guess what we need to do is I'll I'll make a. Uh, I'll make an edit of Major League that doesn't have the topless scene in it because I'm generally weirded out about like 14 year old kids, yeah. you know, and and nudity from the late 80s. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, that's that's the right thing. To we'll do. do it. We'll do a viewing party. Danny's Danny's seen it. I just like fast forwarded through that that part. But, cover your uh, eyes. Cover your eyes. Yeah, don't watch impressionable. I, yeah, we watched uh, we watched Bull Durham and I was like, oh, I forgot about Oops. all this stuff. Yeah. Forgot about all this stuff, but. Uh, yeah, man. I mean, it's just, it's one of those things where, you know, we talked about active choices in terms of, you know, roster construction and balancing play time and, and all this other stuff. I think culture is an active choice. And um, we've seen a decent number of examples of teams in the last couple of years. I'm trying to be a little bit more nebulous so that nobody thinks we're pointing figures at them. Um, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, the, the, emotional environment of youth baseball is just as bad as everybody thinks it is. I would argue that almost all the time. Yeah. And I have seen very few coaches uh, who I would, again, single, no kids, who I would ever let my child play for uh, if I had a child. And, and uh, that's and that's the reality. Yeah. I mean, this is just, uh, I don't know, man. Um, I, I think 
the biggest leverage opportunity we have to improve the environment of youth baseball is to solve that part of it. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, it is the largest area of risk that we have. Uh, we already lose kids at a disproportionate rate relative to every other sport. And in so much as we're in this cycle where like rec baseball environment is, is only continue to get like diminished, whether that's diminished participation or diminished coach training, if what we're going to end up with is more mom and pop run travel club select ball programs left unchecked, it would not surprise me in 10 years to see our game just like reduced to ashes. Yep. Because kids are not going to want to play. They have too many other options. And by ashes, you mean only international players. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, because kids have enough options of other things to do that aren't going to make them feel like shit. Yep. And our game is inherently like faced with that potential, you know, need to navigate failure, I think more than anything else. Right. You know, there, there isn't a lot of stuff where you can just kind of be on the field and be participatory. Your failures are magnified. Yep. You know, like your, your fails, your failures are magnified. And the way that this game is going is we're just like moving it to a place where, you know, the, the select, uh, the select baseball environment is very much designed to like identify and exploit every single kid's flaws. Yep. And we put them in an emotional environment where that stuff is going to be continued to be magnified by the coaches and the adults um, that set the tone for this type of culture stuff. It's not just the kids' flaws that are highlighted, right? Like I'm sure a lot of these coaches are good human beings. Yep. Uh, and we're just like highlighting their worst traits by putting them in that role. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Because they because they impart that failure as a, again as a threat. Right, right. It, it's it's not that I'm trying to teach teach these kids this specific thing. We are somewhere along this kind of like through line of their development of it, and we stress tested it today, and we didn't get the results we wanted. Yep, it's a threat. And Threat. the other thing I'll say there is um, it – all of that doesn't work like the 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 Jobu and all of the stuff I do doesn't work if they get in the car with mom and dad on the way home yeah. and mom and dad is blaming it on other teammates. And like, yeah, you pitched great, but like you, would, you wouldn't have allowed any runs if – uh, your third baseman could make a play. Sure. Uh, and just like planting these little seeds that like now, next time I give the ball to this kid and he's on the mound, if he looks over and the same kid's at third, he's hearing that in, in the back of his head from, yeah. from mom and dad that like, you can't trust this guy. Right. Uh, and like, I have a great group of parents who I know don't do that. Um, but like, it's not just the coaches that are, it's, yeah, that it's, can be extremely toxic. It's, it's the parents and, I would almost argue that the parents are more of an issue in that scenario uh, because coaches, you almost expect it. You get in the car ride on the way home, and if mom or dad is talking a lot of shit about your teammates, yeah. that is what you are going to start to think. Uh, and it's just like setting up a really toxic team culture in a team environment. Yeah. If kids are hearing from their parents that these three kids on my team stink, and now they don't trust those kids. And now they get angry when those kids make errors. And like, you can't win a game on your own. So if mom and dad are telling you on the way home that you're the best player and whatever, like, great, maybe you are. Uh, you can't win a baseball game on your own against nine dudes. Right. Like, you need your teammates. And if all you're doing is putting your teammates down and not believing in them because you're taking your cues from mom and dad or coach, like, it sets up a really... Just like an awful team culture. It's and it's just and it doesn't it doesn't fix anything, man. It doesn't it doesn't change anything. It's like, well, you know, uh, that kid wouldn't have hit the ball if there was a total eclipse of the sun. Uh, meanwhile, when it was you know from the time that it left my hand to the time that it hit the plate, who gives a shit? Right. Like, just go compete. Yep. And a good example from yesterday's game. So we we fight back and tied at six. Uh there's first and second and nobody out because of a really bad catcher's interference call uh, in the seventh inning. That I'm not, I don't know if I'll ever get over the, the yeah. way that game ended, but a really bad catcher's interference call um, that the field umpire called, not the home plate umpire. 
Uh, and so now it's first and second, nobody out. In the bottom of the seventh, what do they ask that next kid to do? It's, it's anyone surprised? So in a massive situation, this kid is asked to bunt. He lays down a bunt directly to the pitcher, fielded, goes to throw to first. Kid is running inside the line. The ball hits him. Everybody's safe. The ball goes on the line. The run scores. Mm -hmm. Should have been called an out because he ran on the inside of the line and directly in the line of the throw. Yeah. Uh, And that's how the game ended. And his dad was, uh, the kid's dad who bunted, was so thrilled. Talking to one of our dads after the the game, who used to play with them and knows them, Mm -hmm. was so thrilled. Do Do you see he walked it off? Yeah. And that kid bunted almost every at bat. Yeah. And like, I hope that that kid had a great day. Yeah. Uh, is that kid going to be playing baseball in two years? And like, these are the, you know, th- these are choices you make. If you're okay with that as a coach, that like, this kid's 14 and I'm, I'm doing my damn best to like make sure he doesn't play at 16 you. Uh, I, like, if you're comfortable with that, then you're comfortable with that. And like, those are not coaches that I want at Driveline Academy. But like, that's also just to be very honest, not really apparent. I want to drive on Academy either. Yeah. Like I would, if that situation happened and I had a coach who did that, a in, in this hypothetical world that would never happen because then they would know they'd have me to answer to after that. Yeah. And that, that wouldn't go well, but say it happens. I would really hope I get a nasty message from that parent about how we took the bat out of her kids or his kids hands in that situation and like how are they supposed to develop and learn whether or not they can compete in that situation if we're not even giving them the opportunity to compete in that situation with nobody out first and second nobody out like you strike out it's not really that big of a deal we may throw a wild pitch in their second and third anyways and you never sure. needed a bunt yep like uh, I would hope I get a nasty message and I don't have a parent who's like, yeah, my kid's awesome. He had a, a bunt that was not a good bunt directly back to the pitcher and then ran on the inside part of the base and, and the ball hit him and, and they we won the game. Like, I would hope that our parents are more angry about that than like totally happy and gladly accepting that result. Um you know, like we, I mean, we're seeing it, we're all seeing it from the same eyes. And that's the thing that I think is, is real um, challenging for me is, is you can see it, you know, like we, we all see it transparently. And when you see these kids get opportunities taken away from them, when you see these kids where trust isn't demonstrated, when you see these kids get pigeonholed in the name of winning, like man, and and not to to be clear, it's it's like, what am I paying you for? Right, right. Like I understand what side of the the, the bread my toast is buttered on. How does that analogy right. go? I, I whatever, think you met. I'm I'm pretty sure you messed that one up, but they get it. I know what side of the line that I'm on. There you go. Uh, we take checks from parents to train children. I get it. Uh. If I was not training the sum totality of what would give leverage to my kids' competitiveness in the current term and the long term, I don't know how, as a parent, I would be satisfied that satisfied with that. And even more so if I saw that played into some, you know, weird stigmatization with the way that they're actually allowed to compete. I, I just, man, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how how I would deal with that, and it makes me honestly really curious how we get more parents to not see it through that same lens. Just like this whole thing just has to be in service of winning, because that's where the whole thing gets perverted, you know. Like, and to be fair to that coach and those parents, they are writing the check for to win. Yeah. Like they're they're writing those checks to those travel organizations 
for wins. It's not uh, it's not to develop my kid. It's just like this. Th- is that's same. not sold to them. No, you're you're right. You're right. But this is the exact argument of like, well, why is why is U.S. soccer so shitty on the international stage? Because of course it is. Yeah. Because the whole thing is designed to satisfy competition wins in an age that doesn't map to where we're supposed to go. Yeah. This is not uh this is not a bug. This is a feature of the way that this thing has been currently constructed. Yep. And 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 I don't understand why because the incentives aren't even there. Right. Like I've got a bunch of trophies from like my teenage years. I don't have them displayed in my house. Facts. I've 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 seen your house. They're not I, I didn't see any bunch of trophies. Danny, I would have loved to, but Danny found a box of them that were like in our in our like our gym. And he was like, Dad, what is this? I was like, I don't give a shit. <laughs> and and I'm I like I'm not trying to impart my perspective on other people just because it's mine and I think that it's right. I'm just like, man, can we just take a clear eyed observation of what we're talking about? We're talking about children. Yeah. We're talking about the competition results of children and like you know, it's like I, I got into an argument with uh, with one of our uh, one of our own parents about like the Giannis um, the Giannis Atuma, I can't, Ante de Kumpo. Yeah, the Giannis. Uh, you know, the quote about you know the reporter lighting him up about you know the season being a failure. I know you're not. You probably missed this, but uh, Joel Embiid doubled down on that last night. I have after to they lost that him. game, he doubled down on that. Yeah, like. Um, I can't tell you what it is to play Major League Baseball because I didn't play Major League Baseball. I cannot tell you what it is to play college baseball because I did not play college baseball. What I can tell you is that I think that you have a higher likelihood of adults that have a a balanced relationship with sport and competition if you impart a balanced relationship of sport and competition to them when they are actual children. And I, man... Prove me wrong, you know, like like prove me wrong that the direction that this thing is going over the course of the next 10, ten years is not going to ruin uh, youth baseball in this country. Yeah, because like because we're going to do the other thing, like oh well, like you know, look at those kids in PR and the Dominican and yada yada yada. Uh, I'm going to reflect back to the Vladdy Guerrero quote from years ago: "The path off the island is really really clear, yeah, and it's a path that's defined by skill." And we are raising a generation of children that think the path to their dreams is these stupid fucking plastic trophies that don't mean anything. And right now, if you're keeping score, they're right and we're wrong. And the direction is not trending uh, to, to like change that balance of power. Are our kids any worse? Are they worse athletes? Are they afforded worse opportunities? No, we're in the most privileged country in the entire world. And we're losing. And I think the reason is pretty clear. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. And uh, it was an interesting conversation with um, some of my kids about uh, Mason Miller, who's the the Oakland guy, who was like a seventh rounder out of like I think a seventh rounder, maybe even later. Yeah, it was, yeah. Out of like D two, D three, like some like real small school, and his numbers at that small school were not very mm-hmm. good. Um, that guy made the major leagues pretty quickly uh, because of his skill. Yeah. They didn't care about his numbers, uh, his competition numbers, I should say. Uh, he had enough skill that they saw something that like, hey, if we put this guy in the right situation, we're gonna have a monster on our hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like, yes. That's that's correct. Uh, and, you know, I think yesterday, because the team we played, uh, and I talked to some of the boys after the game, the team we played uh, beat us last year bad. Mm-hmm. Like, just curb stomped us. Uh, and, they it, like, nobody on my team was like, wow, we were close there. <laughs> it's like, we got our ass kicked. Yep. They were clearly better than us. They were, on average, 30 pounds heavier than we were. Yeah. Uh, and, like, they're, they were just bigger kids. Yesterday was a different story. Uh, we haven't, we've grown a little bit. We're not even remotely close to like hitting puberty for most of my kids, but like, uh, so the size gap hasn't necessarily changed. 
uh, the skill gap has. Changed a lot. Changed a lot. We're throwing just as hard as they are. We're hitting the ball way harder than they did yesterday. Yep. And, like, immediately the kids noticed. And, like, they don't need to win those games to get that feeling yesterday of, like, wow, we got way better. We developed. Like, we're right there. And, like, we lost both games. Yeah. And, like, that was not how they felt. Yeah. And that's, like, again, I know he says a lot. It's a choice. It's an active choice. Yeah. And, like... And it's a choice that might require you as the coach or adult to, like, push your own feelings about this shit to squash it in service of children. Right. I should... When I say it's a choice... I, I should be more clear. It is the harder of the two choices. Yeah. By far. It is way easier to yell at a kid. Way easier to yell at a kid. Sure. Or to bench a kid. Or whatever. It is much harder to, like, do the other thing. Yep. And, like, I only want coaches here that are going to do the other thing. And I wish we had a say of that generally broadly – and we don't. So, like, we are going to deal with uh, having to listen to other teams be coached by people who I wouldn't ever let near a child. Uh, or, like, having high school kids come back uh, after their high school season and talk about how much their coach messed them up mentally. Yeah. Um, and, like, we've got work to do to, like, repair their mental state which we don't have time to do because we're jumping right into our summer ball season. Straight into it. Uh, and like, I wish that I could, you know, I almost wish I could tell the kid, you know what, don't even play high school. Stay with us. Stay with us for the high school season. We'll figure out a way to get you some competition. We'll, we'll play some scrimmages. We'll play some games, whatever we need to do. Uh, and we'll develop you in that time better than they can. Uh, and we will, like, keep your mental state good. Uh, and, like, that's not really a reality that we can do uh, to tell a kid to not not play high school baseball, but like we had five kids, five that didn't make their high school teams from 15, 16, the 18 yep. use. Um, shout out to coach Mark brand. Shout out coach to coach Dylan Mark brands Holly. and coach Dylan Holly and uh, coach Connor Stratton. Yes, man. I, I can't wait to, to write the blog and to get yep. that out about project proven wrong. Yep. Project proven wrong. Uh, a roaring success. Oh yeah. Um, I'll, I'll save that for the blog, but yeah. all those kids got a lot better. Uh, in, in a relatively short amount of time. In the high school during the high school season. Yeah. That was literally it. It was the high school season. That was it. Yeah. Um and it wasn't even the full high school season because we decided after like two weeks into the high school season that we were gonna do this. Yeah. Because we had these five kids that were just kind of on an island and like, all right, we're gonna bring them in and we're gonna call this project Proven Wrong. Yeah. And like we're gonna show the high schools why they should have taken these kids. Uh and it it worked really well. Uh, and like I would love to like do that for all the rest of these kids because um, yes, the training got them better. I would also bet uh, that us telling them this is prove them wrong. Hell yeah. Did more, uh, that, like did enough for their mental state that like we would have seen gains no matter what, even the program shitty. Like us taking these five kids who just got turned away by their high school for one whatever reason and saying, you're not turned away by us. Yeah. Let's let's go prove these guys wrong. We're on your side here. That's I'll send that message every single day. Uh, and like, I can only hope that the high school coaches next year, when these kids go back to tryout, realize what they missed. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm not sure of like a tidy way to to wrap this up, other than to say that um, you know, if you you listen to Jeremy talk about coaching, man, it's just it uh, it takes a lot. It, it takes a lot of care and consideration. Um, and, you know, weirdly, I'm pretty sure that, you know, the, the teams that we play, um, I think those, those coaches are probably putting in similar time. I think the question is, it's just like in service of what? I would – I don't think they're putting in similar time. You don't think so? And I don't know if I'm just like patting myself on the back here, but like <laughs> I I don't – I and, well, right – they might put in the same amount of hours, but theirs go into practice planning. Yeah. Things like that, as opposed to like, what's the mental state of these kids? Like, how do I get the most out of them? Because like, I don't have to worry about practice because we plan that in 
in space. In, in September. Yeah. And just like had a, a YTP that we are rolling with since, since September, yearly training plan, that like we make slight adjustments to, but we know exactly what we're doing on any given day, yeah. on any given day at any given practice. So like I don't have to spend my time and energy thinking about like, all right, how are we going to attack practice? Like I know how that works. Yeah. I get to spend my energy on like, how do I put these kids in the best situations to be as successful as I know they can be? Uh, and like that is definitely not what these coaches are thinking. Yeah. It's how do I how do I win games? Yeah. And uh, I guess you just got to decide, man. Like if you if you want to, I think exemplify um, this commitment to teaching and, and building children up. You have to make that choice pretty flipping firmly. You know, mm-hmm. like you you got to have you got to have that reflected in the way that you distribute workload and you build a team and you distribute bat bats and you distribute playing time. Like it's gotta be, uh, you can't be halfway pregnant. Yep. Um, so hopefully, uh, getting into this level of minutia about like the process of just running one of our teams, um, you know, gives you guys some ideas for like how to execute these ideas in your own, whether that's, you know, flipping, you know, first year kid pitch, uh, or whether that's, you know, building a a competitive high school summer team, man, it's just, um, we, I don't know that we're ever going to be the winningest teams at 14 U on down. Uh, I feel reasonably confident that the foundation that we lay 14 U on down is the thing that sets us up for the greatest opportunity of success relative to the kids that we have um, from 15 you on up to get the most out of it. Cause that's the period of time that it actually starts to like mean something. Yep. That's the whole point. And I'll double down on that. Um, we can cut this if, if you don't want this part in the podcast, but like nobody, um, nobody's quit this year. Yeah. Not the case last year. We had, we had a good amount of people quit in January last year. Nobody's quit. Uh, we have removed a few people. Um, and these were uh, kids that would make our, for the most part, kids that would make our t- our teams win more. Yeah. But didn't get it. And I will make that choice 10 times out of 10 to like let that kid go somewhere else as opposed to like take that toxic attitude that winning is the only thing that matters or the thing that matters most Yep. Uh, and infect the rest of the team with it because uh, it is like a oh, it's shouting fire in a crowded theater. Right. It is. It is a bit of a virus. If you've got a kid who uh, thinks that winning is more important than anything, he's going to bring all of his teammates down when like and make it a way harder job for your coach when he's trying to do the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, so like that is one of the reasons why we won't be the most winning organization at 10 11 12 for sure is because like the kids that all they care about is winning i don't want them here yeah i want the kids who just love baseball and want to get better at baseball and we're gonna do that we're gonna make you better at baseball we're gonna be competitive that's our goal we don't want you to we never want you to get blown out in a game but we're not gonna win every game and that's okay we're gonna be competitive while we develop skill and then you start to really see the difference between you and your peers yeah. once you hit 13 14 is a real eye opener and then you get to high school and you're like oh wow like yeah that that other you know that six feet of distance from 54 to, to 60 man it 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 changes things it changes, it changes things. things you know like uh, i mean we this year again i'm being intentionally broad uh we've seen a kid who was you know pumping high sevens last summer mm-hmm. uh from from a team that we we played, uh, they have another kid that's pumping high sevens. But like, what happened the last twelve months, right? Because we went from seventy two to seventy seven, or seventy to seventy six, or seventy three to seventy nine, or, or whatever. So I uh, man, I'm just I'm really comfortable uh, knowing that like the story of this whole thing is we played out over time. Yeah, I mean the the one I will always point to is. Uh, we lost a lot of 14 U kids from last year to this year because they went with with their old coach. Um, and there's two that stayed. I think it's just the two. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, from that team, I think it's just the two. Uh, and one of them <laughs> uh, was like not one of their best pitchers, uh, like probably like the fifth hardest throwing team on that kid, hardest throwing kid on that team last year. Yeah. If I looked at the numbers, um, they're all throwing the same below, and he's touching eighty seven now. And he was like eighty. He was like 74, 73, 74, 75 last year. Uh, they're all like upper sevens, and now he's throwing eighty seven. Uh, and they're all like, "What in God's name?" It's like, "Yep, you guys didn't develop in the last year." Yeah. And that the fourteen to fifteen, I think Connor said it when he was on the podcast. That is when we see the most biological growth from yep. from from kids. If you're not maximizing that time period of like applying the massive biological growth to skill development, yeah. you are messing up. Yeah. And like we were able to maximize it with like 12 miles an hour in a year for that kid. Yeah. Um, and got him a stop and he was on varsity as a freshman because of it. And like none of the other kids on his team were, uh, and the best pitcher on that team has UCL injury right now. So like, yeah. Uh, intentional choices, a crap ton of them. Just uh, imagine, just like the the math. Who was it that was getting that award? It what's it's what's her name that played the mom on Stranger Things? Why am I blanking on her name now? When she was Winona getting, Ryder. Winona Ryder when she's getting the award and she's like looking at all the math. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's that meme, just yeah. over and over and over, uh, but with like a really specific intention uh, and I think a real specific north star what the outcome of this whole thing is supposed to be. Yep. So hopefully going into this level of granular detail about the way that we run the entire thing, you can basically take Jeremy's process for what he described for kind of one team and imagine running 16 different, 16 different teams that way. Um, and then you get my job. <laughs> actually, no, you can't hire my guy. Sorry. Um, I promise, man, the, the juice is worth the squeeze. I really 100,000% believe that. Um, so... Um, I don't have any funny stuff for us to end with. Okay. Um, we got uh, Connor Reynolds coming up. We got Chad Longworth coming up. Uh, I want to get Stratton on here to talk about our HP stuff in more detail because we've got a lot of test retest to kind of go through about that idea of like why we want to maximize development specifically on the strength side to kind of affect the the athletic stuff. Uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get Coach Mark Brands on here to talk about what he did yeah, with Proven Wrong. Yeah, Project and we'll tie that wrong. with when the blog comes out. Yeah, so we'll get we got a whole bunch of stuff coming. Uh, I think we're we've got enough in the can now that ideally by the time this comes out we've moved to weekly. So. Um, and Thank you guys. stay tuned because we are going to do an episode where we bring kids on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I completely forgot about that. Yeah. We're going to bring some of our Academy kids on. Um, so I you can hear it from them and not just us. Yeah, yeah. Um, so prepare for some very ridiculous content to come out of that particular exercise. Um, thank you guys for the likes and the subscribing and the notifications and all of that stuff. Uh, the pod keeps potting. Yeah. Um, I keep threatening that we're going to make merch. I really want to make like a no take signs shirt. Like I want to do all the things. Um, so yeah, I'm oh, that was one of the funnier moments from the weekend. This, this is what I'll end with. Uh, and then you can do the, the like and subscribe thing again. But I, uh, we had, so the kid who shoved on Saturday. Yeah. We're in the bottom. We're in the, we were the away team. So we're in the top of the seventh inning. We go uh, first pitch line drive out both the first two batters. Yeah. And I have never given a take sign to any of my kids ever. And my leadoff hitter is up, and I know how much he loves swinging at the yeah, first pitch. Yeah, he likes to ambush. So I call time, and I bring him over. And, like, we're not far outside of the batter's box. And the umpire can clearly hear what I'm saying. And I was like, I promise you I will never ask you to do this again. And I've never asked you to do this before. But here's the situation. He has already gone six scoreless innings and is shoving. I want him to go back out and throw the seventh. I need him to get a little bit more of a break. Yeah. We've had two one pitch outs. So I need you to take this first pitch. And the ump, sorry, I could see the ump laughing. And uh, he was, and he's like, okay, takes the first pitch. It's a ball. Takes the second pitch. It's a ball. And then uh, gets a hit. And we end up scoring a run that inning. Yeah. Like we had a little bit of rally with two outs. Uh, so like, then he gets like plenty of time to sit or whatever. And I'm leaving the field uh, to go back to the dugout after the, that half inning. And the ump stops me and goes, you've never had a kid take. And I was like, Nope. And he's like, you don't even, you don't have a take sign. And I was like, I do not. And he's like, why don't you have a take sign? And I was like, why would I? And he's like, well, that situation. I was like, yeah, I could just call time and tell him in that situation. Sure. And like, I only have to tell him once and then yeah. they'll know if I see two, one pitch outs auto take in that third at bat. Yeah. And, uh, it was just like the umpire was just like, so dumbfounded that like, you don't have a take sign. 
No, I do not. Uh, which may have been maybe the reason he was so dumbfounded is because uh, this is where I'll, where I'll actually end the podcast. Uh, the other team, uh, he forced his kids to take the first pitch of every single at bat. My kids figured it out in the second inning and just threw like. A, bullets uh, uh, just yeah. like a 60 mile an hour strike right down the middle and then went slider pitch two fastball pitch three and we were out of there extremely fast because they couldn't pick up timing on anything because they were down in the count immediately good coaching oh i have so many things that i could say about <laughs> the dirty look that that guy gave me when i wore my never spun shirt but i digress like subscribe do all the things we appreciate the algorithmic support we'll catch you guys next time